a sister <clears throat> says, protesting with slogans and banners is not part of Islam. As we see today's situation of the hijab ban in schools and colleges in South India, what can be done Islamically to get out our rights? Because if, we ev if everyone goes home and not protest, it will not put pressure on authorities. First of all, the issue of protesting and demonstration has been cleared out by the scholars of Islam, such as Bin Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Al-Albani, may Allah have mercy on their souls. And it is not part of the way of the Salaf. I know that I could be really famous if I just ride the wave and say that we have to fight, we have to do this, we have to do that. Till when are we going to be oppressed and not uh, 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 talk and, and voice our op opposition to what's happening? We have to do this. That would make me really famous. And I would have lots of viewers. The biggest problem is that we have to ask ourselves this question. Do we want to follow Sharia or do we want to follow our whims and desires? Yes, there will be people criticizing and saying, this is all what you sheikhs good at. Talk. You don't do anything. You don't react. You're sitting in the comfort of your home while we are suffering and this and that, blah, blah, blah. This is a price we have to pay, unfortunately. Again, you did not answer my question. Do you want to follow Sharia or do you want to follow your whims and desires? For me, in the midst of the comfort of my home, I could say, pick up arms, demonstrate, loot, burn shops, do this, do that. But this is not the role of scholars of Islam. As Al-Hassan al-Basri said, may Allah have mercy on his soul, when fitna comes, only the scholars see it. When it's over and done, everybody sees it. So in the beginning, you hear voices calling for jihad, for violence, for fighting. But when the dust falls down and it's all over and you start to count the body count and you start to evaluate your losses, here is when laymen and normal people relate and say, Subhanallah, the Sheikh said so and so. I wish we had listened. Why do we say this? In Islam, we don't act upon our emotions. Rather, we have to calculate the pros and the cons. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran, do not insult, do not curse the idols which they worship. So that the idol worshippers would not retaliate by cursing Allah Azza wa Jal. So cursing and abusing and exposing the idols that they worship is a good thing because it's being worshipped beside Allah and it has no value. It has nothing to offer. It doesn't protect from harm and it doesn't provide you any good. 
But because insulting it and cursing it would lead the idol worshippers to retaliate by insulting Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah tells us, don't do that. So coming back to the issue of hijab ban in southern India. Is it the first? No. It's been practiced in France, in Belgium, in many countries in Europe, and it's becoming a trend objective to fight Islam. You don't have to beat around the bush. They want to eliminate Islam from their lives. They want to force the Muslims to blend in, which means to lose their identity and to be like the disbelievers. Now, in southern India is a different issue. So it's like a tug of war. You pull and I pull. And let's see what happens. When you say that we have to stand up for our rights, and the only way to do so is by demonstrating and raising the flags and banners, etc., and marching in the streets. Is this the right approach? You've confirmed that this is not according to the Quran and the Sunnah. So is it the right approach? Well, if we look in the seerah, we will find that the Prophet ﷺ remained in Mecca for 13 years. He was ordered not to fight. They used to abuse him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his companions. They used to torture them. In some incidents, they killed some of them. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal did not allow them to fight back. Thinking of it, if Allah were to allow them to fight back, as a minority, the idol worshippers would have annihilated them. And Islam would have been eradicated and finished. So for 13 years, the Prophet ﷺ was ordered to refrain, to pull back, not to fight back, not to defend themselves. To the extent that they were allowed to do two hijras and to migrate to Abyssinia, to look for a safe haven for them to worship Allah. And finally, they were allowed to migrate to Medina. <clears throat> now, the Muslims in India, are they a minority or a majority? They're a minority. Even this minority, do they fit in the category which was mentioned in Chapter 8, Surah Al-Anfal at the very end? <clears throat> when Allah Azza wa Jal had set the minimum requirements to fight an enemy that is more than our number, in the beginning, we were ordered to stand firm when the enemy is 10 times more than our number. 10 times. We were not allowed to flee or to run for our lives. We have to stand firm till we are victorious or we are martyred fighting. And then Allah reduced this and made it one to two. So if they are double our number, we have to stand firm in the battlefield. If they're more than that, then we have the concession and the permission to re-strategize or to catch up with other Muslim forces to regain power and relaunch an offensive later on. What's the ratio of Muslims to the non-Muslims? Allah says 
وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Prepare for the enemies, whatever you can, of force, which is archery at the time, now weaponry, military um, uh, equipment, etc., is required. Are the Muslims prepared? Are the Muslims as a minority all on the same page with one another? Or we have different sects and cults and leaders. So the entire ummah is divided into many, many sects. And they cannot find common ground to come into terms and unite. Why am I saying all of this? Because throughout history, and I I'm, I'm, I'm apologize, this is not becoming a Q&A, but this is an important question. And this is not live TV, so this is uh, um, a YouTube channel. So I think I have the liberty to take my time. Why am I addressing this? Because the consequences that we see is not what others see. And you can imagine, you do the math, think with your logic, not with your heart and emotions. What is the result of standing in front of the majority who are backed by the authorities who are kafir, disbelievers, who carry great enmity and hatred to the Muslims. And they have the police force, they have the army, they have the guns. What are the consequences? People would say, yes, yes, there will be casualties, but we have to sacrifice. The casualties that will take place. What is the impact on their families? Do you think that the mother of a 17-year-old boy who was killed and lynched, she would say, Alhamdulillah, my son was martyred and I have 10 more to give for the sake of Allah? We've seen the reactions of some families. We've seen the reactions of some non-practicing Muslims who started cursing Islam cursing the hijab. All what they care about is to eat and drink. That's it. So they don't share with you your concerns. They are not with you on the same page. And this is why instead of being reactive to such incidents, we have to prepare ourselves. <clears throat> we have to start establishing aqidah so that when push comes to shove, we have firm Muslims standing and not budging, being steadfast and with firm feet on the ground, unshaken. Without aqidah, you can't do this. Without unity of the Muslims, you can't do this. Without prior preparation, you can't do this. So this is what we are afraid of happening. If we were to go down the line and say, yeah, go do head prostrate, uh, uh, do uh, protest and demonstration and do this and do that. We've seen what they can do with their hatred against Islam. So the livelihood of Muslims, their safety is a priority. And this is our main concern. How can we react to such unjust ban of the hijab, there are many peaceful ways. Expose them on the internet, on social media. Let the whole world share with you their atrocities, their lack of democracy, because they claim and brag that they're democratic and they are the worst of totalitarian regimes like China. So expose them big time. 
you have the internet, you have social media, you have Western media that is thirsty and hungry for such news. Though they share the same disbelief and kufr, but they have the hidden agendas, so they would also expose their totalitarian government and authority, the PGP, the PGB, or whatever they call it, and their their, their Kafir uh, uh, regime, and they would show the plight of the Muslims. But we cannot justify something that is against the way of the Salaf, something that is wrong by their wrong actions. Because two wrongs do not make a right, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best.